Well, he doesn't look, so I'll get started. So, welcome. I have this microphone, which I'm not used to. Is it okay from the audibility? Perfect. So, my name is Alex. I work for a company named Viverica. Uh, you may know it also as Apache Flink. And I'll be talking about moving with the flow. So, in the end, it's a pitch for why you should look into data stream processing. So, let me set the scene. For many years, batch processing was quite the norm. You may recall mainframes still being around, and that's often what we see in our client base is still being the norm in how you process data. What we also see is changes in IT business and society. So for example, when I log on to my banking app, I do not want to see what I've done today, tomorrow. I want to see it now. But it's still being done in batches quite often. I want fresh data, not old data. Furthermore, yeah, the data is growing by the day, so we need to do something with it because we can't just store it as it comes very often. And then last not least, I mean, me being German, we have a lot of these privacy topics to deal with. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how that sits here in the UK or elsewhere on the planet, but um, I spend most of my time talking about data privacy and data locations, etc., etc. So that also has an impact on how and where we process data. So what I'll be talking about is how data is processed, why is it processed, how to handle it, where it is processed, and then I'll cover some use cases. So how is it processed? Just a quick recap to get the terminology right. Batch processing is when we process large volumes of data in batches. It's typically triggered by time or by volume, um, and the users need to accept the delay because it's not instant. So it's what we've seen traditionally in banking systems and what we also see in data warehousing systems. You offload data from an airplane engine, you do something overnight, the next morning the engineers come to work and see something with it. That's batch processing and it's fine. In stream processing, however, it's somewhere between batch and real time. And I'll cover real time in a second. So stream processing is about analyzing data as it happens. It could be cross-source, it can be a single source, and there's typically very little delay between input and output of the data. It's only sort of defined by the complexity of your business logic, what you do with the data. So examples here are IoT device monitoring, IT security monitoring, and uh, money transfers. Like we do have clients doing the SEPA uh, real-time money transfer with Apache Flink. Also, the typical example we've been beating on for the last couple of years was credit card fraud detection. That's an example of a near real-time data stream processing use case. And um, e-commerce pricing or yeah, user recommendations. I'll cover that in my use cases a bit later. Then on the far right, we have real-time processing, which is probably the pinnacle of data processing. But it takes a lot of hardware. It typically takes some kind of real-time operating system. And it's just very um, complicated to implement, typically, even today. So your air traffic control, you want to be real-time. When you go into your e-vehicle and you turn on your autonomous driving thing, you want it to be real-time, not yesterday. And that's why I'm saying real-time processing is good for what it is, but it's probably not for everyone. Who of you were queuing this morning to get in here? The majority of you. That's how your data feels when you batch process it, by the way. So why is it processed? Um, four things we typically see in our clients, why they're processing data. It's because time, scale, consistency, and maintainability. And sorry, I was told white and orange doesn't work, but that's my mistake. Um, but I couldn't change it. So why time? Um, user and stakeholder expectations typically make us process data so that we have it in time for them to make an information or see it. Also for accuracy and relevance, we process data. If it's coming from multiple inputs, we maybe want to correlate it. It has to be automatic in some kind of way. So when it's offloaded and dumped somewhere, you want the output to be happening somewhere. So it has to be processed in time. And then last but not least, there's that big discussion on future versus past. So when I got into data about 20, 25 years ago, it was all about looking at the past in order to predict the future. 
And back then we were okay to take a day or two days of delay. But today predicting the future with something that is two days old could be dangerous. In terms of scale, data growth, I mean, it's, it's, it's growing to an extent, um, I don't know the numbers, and there's a lot of famous quotes, but it is just becoming more and more. Um, private and public cloud. Well, yeah, the point I wanted to make here is you can throw hardware at any problem, but there's a limit. In cloud, it may be seemingly unlimited until you get the invoice. But still, there's some kind of limitation to where we can grow to for this to make sense. And then geographical distribution. I talked about GDPR, data privacy, data policies. I do speak to a lot of banks, and they do not want to process their Swiss banking data in the US. And there's others who don't want to process their African mining data in, uh, I don't know, Germany. So it has to somehow scale and be relevant to where things are happening. And then last but not least, consistency is always a topic in data. You don't want it to be um, inconsistent, and there's the concept of eventual consistency in data. But overall, it has to be consistent at some point in time. And that may be because of governance issues. You do want to correlate your different sources at some point in time and be sure that what you see is right. You do um, want it to be re yeah, reliable and trustworthy. If you can't trust your data, then what's the value of it? Also, um, smart, I had put it here. Um, it has to be smart in how it does things. So it has to be learning, maybe. Uh, and that's the whole idea of AI and machine learning, I guess. But it also has to be transparent in what it has learned. If you have two autonomous vehicles, it's all good that they learn human behavior. But if one doesn't know the other vehicle's behavior, there's a bit of an issue to it. So you have to be able to show a consistent transparency in that point of view. And then last but not least, maintainability. Um, we deal with a lot of large enterprises. They have IT departments. Their head of IT wants to sleep well overnight and be sure that whatever he offers to his developers or his lines of business can be maintained and can be scaled. So it's about running and maintaining an infrastructure. It's about ownership of who owns the data, who owns the platform, who owns the metadata of the data. And then um, often we see change or differences of all of that when it's between development, testing, and production. So we have clients where it's perfectly fine to develop in cloud. And it's somewhat OK to test in cloud. But they would never, ever run their um, data analysis in cloud, just because it's too private. So horses for courses, I think, is what the English say. And then again, um, what may the future bring? So often we have decisions based on our past experience. But only if you've experienced the new, you become a hunger for something else. So when you are setting up and creating systems, what we typically recommend to people is test it, try it, learn, and then see what comes from that learning. So handling growth, as I said, um, throwing more hardware at a problem is a solution that works until your credit card burns. And it has become super simple in the yeah, cloudy times. But is it really the best solution? So yeah, cloud computing is just using somebody else's computer in the end. But when you take a decision on pr data processing, you should really think about where does the business logic live? Does it have to live on cloud? Does it have to live in your own data center? Can it live in multiple locations? If it lives in multiple locations, how do you make sure that whatever you process is consistently processed the same way? Also, when you look at your tool set, how many layers of smartness do you need? Just walking around here, I think there's uh, four or five things you can put on a wall to work together, and each of them will have an intelligence uh, engine. Each of them will have a data governance engine. Some people will have backups or DRs or whatever. It's, it's important to look at what does whatever you need best at what level. And then also, who are your users? And where's the data generated? If my users are in China and I generate that in the US, um, apart from latency, there may be a couple of other issues. Does the data actually have the permission to go cross-border? 
Then when you think about stream processing, it's, it's also what are the use cases and user stories behind it? Do you just stream because it's sexy? Do you batch because it's what you've known? Um, in a way, think about what the user wants and then you'll probably find the best solution to it. And yes, I know the word app is a bit beaten to death, but is it an app or is it just a job? What I mean by that is in, in, in some technologies, like for example in Apache Flink, you can write your business logic and your application in a way that you can take it from one platform to another and it runs the same way, it's predictable, and it's not just a job. Also, when you scale it, you scale an app and not a job, which is just philosophically maybe a slightly different way of looking at how you may build or how you may size or how you may code something. So where's the data processed? Again, I think I come across this picture about 12 years ago. Um, welcome to the cloud. So what we often see, in, and again walking around here, is a tendency right now to go into public cloud. So Azure, AWS, and the likes are all very good clouds. Um, I've also seen a lot of companies moving hybrid or multi-hybrid. I once said mybrid because it was easier to say. It's, it's, it's often a combination of everything that you as a developer or as an IT person, as a line of business need to satisfy. And it often goes back to what I've said earlier in terms of where's the process, who is the process for, what are the GDPR uh, things. Um, also, in our industry recently, we have this fully managed thing. Um, everybody fully manages my stack. It's all good up to the point where um, some company gives me a questionnaire which is harder to fill in than anybody or anything else on the world about privacy, ISO, SOC compliance and whatever else I'm doing and I'm just, do I really want to be in that business? Um, so what I want to say on that slide is um, whenever you think about processing data, it's, it's really easy to go with one or the other. But keep in mind there may be a use case where you have to go the other other way. And then make sure that whatever you do can be ported to that other world. So use cases. Um, I'm way too quick. I'm sorry for that. Um, I had a bit of an issue preparing proper use cases because some of these are our customers and we're under NDA, so I have to speak about it in, in, in high level terms. Um, you may know that Viverica is owned by Alibaba, which is the third logo, so I can speak about that one. So Alibaba um, is one of the biggest users of Apache Flink. They scale to about 19 to 20,000 CPUs cores on, on Flink. And what they do with it is in the e-commerce world, um, take about 16,000 different data points of users, users' behavior. Um, and in these shopping festivals that they have in China, like 1111, which I think is similar to a Black Friday here, um, do use that as a recommendation engine. It's all done in real time. It's done per user. It's done per action. There's very little of, of um, preparation in it. So the data points they may use is simple, Jex, um, yeah, gender, age, what have they purchased before, etc., etc. But it's all up about 16,000 behavioral points or um, describing elements that they've discovered of relevance for their recommendation engine. So it's one of the biggest installations we've seen on this planet. Another one I can talk about is Netflix. Um, so Netflix, when you log on to their GUI, you see a couple of, yeah, depending on your um, screen, a couple of lines of things you should watch, like series or movies or what's hot or what you've uh, watched before. Every time you uh, move a mouse or a pointer or your remote, it's kind of recomputing what it shows you there. And they're testing whether something that you click is always on the 10th position or is it always on the first position. All of that is being processed uh, through Apache Flink as a stream in near real time when you log in. When you speak to them, you'll find out they'll actually do it per device, per login, per location. 
So if you share your account with uh, five people in your family, it's actually not computed as that one account, it's actually computed per device. So if you have a tendency to watch porn and you don't want your wife to know, then you should be safe. <laughs> That's just a joke. Um, so yeah, conceptually, let's look at it. Um, so on the left hand side, we have an input. On the right hand side, we have an output. In the middle, we have what we call the Flink runtime. So inputs could be text files, JSONs, Kafkas, whatever yeah, we have as a data input. In Flink, we take that and we analyze it based on what you program it to analyze. It could be written in Java, it could be written in Scala, it can be written in Python, you can SQL, you can mix and match um, any of these analytical issues. And yeah, you can run it on any cloud pretty much. It could be IaaS, SaaS, PaaS, FaaS. So yeah, different cloud providers offer you um, a fast service. Others offer you a more boring IaaS installation like we do. But the point I want to make is in Flink, you have the ability to um, run a business logic. You have an ability to do something based on the data that you get. It can be as a stream, but it can also reopen past data. So we have clients where they're looking at about 30 days of data for every stream that they do. Take the example of the Oyster card. You tap in and you tap out. But you may tap in and tap out over a week. You may tap in and tap out over a month. Then depending on how you've tapped and what was the best solution, you may get a different price. And all of that is done in near real time and re-evaluated every time that you tap in and tap out. As an example, it's, it's not a customer of ours, so I'm just making that up uh, for example's purpose, but I have customers doing stuff like that. So when we go back to this list and ING, for example, they're using it for the real-time money transfers. So when you want to transfer money to a friend of yours in the SIPA region, you can do um, a real-time transfer, which costs you typically one euro. Um, and they are evaluating a lot of data points during that. It's not as simple as you enter a name and off it goes. It's actually checking, do you have enough cash in your account? Is it a good transfer? Like, are you transferring a lot of money to Nigeria that may trigger some alarm bells? And sorry if anybody's from Nigeria, it's, it's, it's just an example. Um, also, I mean, it's, it's been beaten to death, the whole credit card fraud detection uh, thing. So Visa, MasterCard, I know, are using um, Flink. And they're doing that to check whether whatever you do with your credit card is a good transaction or not. So if you imagine that to run on, on, on batch or even micro batching, and you'd have to wait a minute or two, that would be not really what the user wants. It has to be real time, instantaneous, sub one or two seconds. Um, Splunk are using Flink, um, and you can guess what they're doing with it. So when you are looking at their uh, dashboards, etc., etc., there's a lot of real-time stuff underneath it. And last example I want to cover is Pinterest, um, also using Flink, and they've been one of the first-day users. Um, in essence similar to the Netflix use case, just looking at their website or app users' behavior and then giving you suggestions based on what you've looked at before. So if, if you have that thing today that you like, uh, I don't know, white furry animals and you start looking for white furry animals, obviously you don't want to see black non-hairy animals. So it's, it's, it's all in real time as you go through it, all processed in Flink. Um, so coming back maybe to that Netflix example and, 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 and swip, swapping over here. The original design of that Netflix, and they've discussed it in the meetup, so it's, it's okay to talk about it, was about 18 or 19 different elements of analysis that they've done. They then discovered that it took too long, that it was not reliable, that it didn't work across platforms, and they've also discovered it didn't work across the multiple regions they were having. Because as I said, as, as stupid as it may be, there's a lot of account sharing and, and some people may be logged into the west of the US and others may be logged into Asia using the same account. But the uh, yeah, recommendations engine had to, be, had to be consistent. So they started putting a lot of business logic into their Flink 
um, programming where previously they used that in a different engine. And they've also put that business logic in all of the different locations. So it's almost like a distributed um, processing engine. And this goes back to what I've said earlier about it's an app, not a job. You can take that app, it's a jar file, and put it to any location that you need to process data in. If, for example, you need to process on Azure in South America, but on AWS in the UK or Ali Cloud in China, you can take that same file and just port it between locations. And that was one of their main use cases, which is, is hard to show on that slide, I admit, but um, for some things I'm under NDA, for this one I wasn't, but I didn't get the proper slide. So in the end, why are all of these guys doing that is, is a learning journey. They had a use case. Typically, we deal with developers. They were given a task to do something. They then come to help. They discover stream processing. Um, but it seems yeah, the value of stream processing is increasingly being discovered by lines of business. So lines of business are now demanding it. So that's why we have, and that's the only slide about our product, um, taken the Apache Flink streaming engine, which is an open source product. Um, it's, it's, it's a very vivid and uh, livable community. I think it's, it's the second most active on GitHub um, in that area of, of um, data processing and bundle it into a more enterprise-y version which includes uh, lifecycle management, multi-tenancy, etc., etc. I'm not going to bore you with all of the commercial things here. And as I said, I'm way too quick, but then at least we'll get coffee earlier. Um, come and speak to us if you want to see more use cases. We can show you some more details on our booth, which is right over here. But don't let the tech challenge challenge your business. If you've come from a mainstream, um, not a mainstream, sorry, a mainframe batch processing kind of background, do look around and see whether stream processing could be of help. There's no point taking a mini and putting a camper van or like a caravan in the back of it. It can work, but it's probably not the best car to pull it. Also, stream your data and make decisions on fresh information. It's okay to start with historical data. It's okay to learn from historical data, but the real value of stream processing lies in using it to make business decisions for the future. Like the Alibabas or the AWSs or the Amazons of the world, do process in near real time and do something with it now. If you look at it tomorrow, well then maybe batch processing would still tick the box. Also, when you are designing a stream processing um, solution, think about apps, not jobs. I've used that a couple of times. In essence, it's about scalability. Can you scale across multi-clouds, multi-regions? Can you cover different GDPR requirements as you go into that technology? And can you use the same business logic anywhere? It's, it's okay if, if, if that one use case is only relevant for a bank in Australia. But if you're working for a global company and you do have to do things on, 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 on different locations, uh, maybe even on the edge, then let's make sure that you have that covered. Yeah, well, that one is, is, is a bit of a, um, a repeat. Uh, use your data to make decisions. Don't just store it. Uh, we saw a lot of companies processing data, storing it, and then... Um, like when I got to work in, in the data industry, I ended up having four different um, data warehouses, which seemingly all had the same data. When, but yeah, when we processed it, it had all different numbers. It, it made no sense. You didn't know where it came from. So that's the whole data governance topic probably to look into. But yeah, don't overdo it. Don't store it, use it. And to cloud or not to cloud, there is no question. The only question is how. If you go fully managed, that could be uh, perfectly fine, but, but maybe the solution down the road is to go partially managed or you may manage it yourself. And that's stuff we're happy to talk about in our booth, and that's why we're saying move with the flow. And that's the data stream flow that we have as our little logo icons there. And yeah, and thank you, and find us over there.